Hi, I'm Tanya Curran of ScalyAdventures.com. I'm Pierce's mom. And recently, Pierce came to me with a Reptiles Magazine article that he was so moved by. It was about a boa constrictor named Lucky Stars whose owner had tried to cut its head off. And Teresa Shisk Sailing from the Reptile Hospice and Sanctuary of Texas rescued it, took it to a local vet, and they saved this boa constrictor. The story is amazing. The pictures were intense. And we were so moved by it that Pierce said, I want to contact Teresa and see if she would be willing to share her story with us for Scaly Adventures. We know our friends and fans just love animals like we do. And Teresa instantly answered us and she said she would love to share the story because she is so passionate about animals and reptiles especially. And she started the Reptile Hospice and Sanctuary of Texas and runs it and is just such an amazing woman that we wanted to share this story with you. So Pierce has interviewed her by phone. Um, she's in Texas, we're in South Carolina, and we wanted to share this interview with you today. And please visit her website, which is www dot r h a n d s t dot com that's r h and s t dot com and big thank you to Teresa Shisk Sailing for this interview today enjoy hi Miss Teresa hi Pierce how are you today I'm doing great how about you Oh, I'm doing pretty well. Well, I'm excited to do this interview today. I'm very excited, too. I've been looking forward to this all week. <laughs> Me, too. Well, um, let's uh, first, uh, so let's go ahead and um, get this on the road. So how did this all happen? What? How did this all come to happen? Okay, let me give you a little background. I'm a registered veterinary technician, and I have worked at Texas A&M um, in the College of Veterinary Medicine in the small animal clinic. So I've gotten to know a lot of veterinary students who are now practicing veterinarians, and they all, uh, a good portion of them know that I, uh, my husband and I have a sanctuary for unwanted reptiles for whatever reason people that don't want them anymore, can't take care of them. And they come and live with us. And um, every now and then I'll have a student who's not real comfortable with reptiles, but they do know that if anything were to ever happen and they needed help with a reptile, they knew who to call. So one of my former students um, works in a, a clinic in a uh, South Texas town that um, her clinic works with the animal control in her community. And she got a, um, a snake in. She knew it had been injured, but she did not know to what extent. She didn't mess with it. She's not comfortable with snakes. She doesn't know anything about their uh, um, treatment or, or medicine for snakes, but she just left it in its cage and called me and asked me if I could come get it. And they're about two, two and a half hours away from us. Wow, that's so, a long time. Uh, we went down to, to go see what was going on, and um, she had left her. It was in a dog crate inside a cage covered up, quiet and dark, and uh, she's a little cold, but that actually probably um, helped in this particular instance. Um, I took the, the snake out of the dog crate that she was in, and as I, she was kind of protecting herself, hiding her head, which was a little unusual, but as I eased her out of the crate that she was in and realized the extent of her injuries, her entire neck area or what would be a neck area on any other animal was just macerated, was sliced open. Um, her spinal column, the bone, was actually severed. All of the musculature was cut away. The only thing that was holding this poor creature's neck on her body was the scutes, the lower portion, the skin on the bottom side her trachea and her esophagus, even her jugular vein had been cut. Oh, my and as gosh. I, and as I'm, I'm looking at this poor creature, she, she takes her tail and wraps it around my hip, and she's, like, holding on for dear life. And the, the veterinarian that had called um, offered to euthanize her uh, once we realized the extent of her injuries. And my husband was saying, you know, this is probably the best. And I'm, I'm looking at this snake, and she's holding on, and I said, no, she does not want to give up. We're not going to give up. 
So I started taking pictures with my phone and texting them to my my friend and my veterinarian, Dr. Sharman Hoppus at Texas A&M, and I'm going, please tell me we can try. We've got to try. This snake does not want to die. And she sent me a text back. She said, what happened? And I told her, and she said, bring her on. So we uh, boxed her up and headed back to, to College Station, and um, uh, Dr. Hoppus, her intern, Dr. K, Dr. James, he's a zoo vet now in Waco, and um, the fourth-year vet student who was Casey Preeby, who's now Dr. Casey Preeby, um, and I worked on this poor creature who was incredibly cold, and with, with reptiles, that makes anesthesia a bit of a, a challenge because their circulation's not working properly. Um, so it was it was an ordeal. It was um, it was interesting, but we got her. She she's a fighter. She she wanted she hung in there, and we uh, Dr. Hoppus was incredible. Got all her musculature sewed back together. Made a patch to to cover the nick in her uh, jugular vein. That as she started warming up, she started bleeding out. So that was a kind of a an ER moment. Um, panic moment where, you know, what are we going to do? But we got her at the bleeding stopped, got the jugular vein patched, uh, made sure that the trachea and esophagus were intact. And as long as those two structures were okay, the rest of it we thought we could patch up and put back together. And um, we got, got her done. It took us about five hours to get everything flushed out, cleaned out, and, and put back together. And we, we kind of joke that um, uh, Casey's biggest job uh, while monitoring anesthesia was making sure that her head stayed straight because there were no markers. The muscles were so so um, shredded and, and had no context to them, no, no, um, no focal points to, to match anything up. She had to make sure that her little head was on straight and uh, we kind of joke that Charmin did such a good job that she even matched up the pattern. And if you just look at her pattern on her, where she's healed now, it, it just flows so natural. There's no scar. The only way you can tell anything happened is that she does have some atrophy. The muscles are not quite as plump and as filled out as they should be, but um, they function. She can swallow. Um, she eats very well for us now. And um, she's gaining weight. She's looking good. Wow, that's amazing for any snake to be able to recover from such a horrific wound and do so well. That is, that's a real trooper of a snake. She is, she's amazing, and, and we still, even with, with Frank and I dealing with her on a, on a daily basis, and um, I take her back to A&M for lectures and, and presentations and such, and, and nobody... Everybody that dealt with her, nobody can believe that she's still alive, that she's made it through all this, and is, and has as good an attitude as she has. We we love telling her story. We have a little um, poster board with pictures and, and a t- typed out story so people can read about her, and, and we take her with us when we go places, and um, it's she's just amazing. She's just amazing. Wow. Well, I, I just have to know. How did um, she get such a horrific wound? I know that could not have happened in the wild. Oh, absolutely not. Totally human-induced. Um, her previous owner, for whatever reason, had not bothered to feed her for a number of months. Oh, my gosh. Um, from what I understand, we got her, um, was the 27th of July. Um, the story is that she had not been fed since January. Wow, that's and so I point, I point out to people that that's like not feeding your dog for two weeks. Um, but for whatever reason, she wasn't being fed. And the story is that the um, previous owner was putting water in her cage or reached in to get her water bowl, and she um, lucky stars bit her on the hand and wrapped around her arm. And the person panicked and called 911. And... Um, for whatever reason, the, the first responders felt the only recourse was to um, cut the snake's head off. Wow, that's why they just even didn't more simply unwrap her. I, but and and people say, well, you, you 
well, you weren't in the situation, you don't know. I've been bit. Anytime you work with reptiles, You've been especially bit. a large number of reptiles for a number of years, you're going to get bit. It happens. Oh, yeah. I've, but, I've only had, I only have about 18, and I've only had 18 for about two or months or so, and I've gotten bitten before. And there are so know, many other ways to get a snake off of you besides cutting its head off. Absolutely, and I, I just so it. She's um, a great learning tool, teaching tool. We use her to explain, you know, some of the other methods. And the for the non-snake people, you know, as long as you have alcohol, uh, just some plain old alcohol, it doesn't hurt them. It smells nasty. It tastes bad, and they'll let go. You don't have to hurt them. And in fact, I mean, if you think about it, if you hurt something, it's first instinct is to bite harder or bite more um so it just you just especially if you're holding yourself out to the community as an animal quote unquote expert um you shouldn't one have an animal you're not comfortable with or you're afraid of or two that you you're not prepared to care for them properly if you can't care for them properly you need to pass them on to someone else who can take care of them properly. Yes, that that's I've always said that, but even better, before you go out and buy the animal, you should gra- you should buy a book. Spend, you know, 10 or 5 bucks and just go out there and get a decent book on the animal that you want to purchase because a book can always be returned, but an animal can't. Absolutely. And then you're passing it on to someone else to have to take care of. Now, I love what I do, and I love my animals, and they're, they're all pets. We do. Um, everybody's got a name, and people kind of laugh at me that I have names for all the animals that we have here, but they're pets first and foremost. Occasionally, we'll find um, homes for some of them, adopt them out. Um, we work off referrals. Um, we don't, like, advertise that we have animals for adoption. So we work mostly off referrals of people we know that so that we're we're more comfortable that they're going someplace where they will be cared for and that that uh, because we don't we really don't have time to go do home checks and background checks and all of that so that's why we we rely on referrals from either former students or neighbors uh, or people that friends that we know and that will vouch for the the folks that are wanting a, a new pet. And we'll adopt things out that way, but um, otherwise, these animals are, are our pets, and we name them, and we care for them, and we do a lot of research, and uh, especially when we get a new um, species. I recently took in, uh, well, I guess it's been a couple of years now, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> um, a, I got a blood python. I never thought I would get one in as a rescue because they're not, you know, most of what we get in are things that are sold relatively inexpensively, which unfortunately seems to be a deciding factor on what reptile someone's picking, especially if they've never owned one before. They get something cheap, and it doesn't always make the best pet. No, no, not at all. So, so I don't always see the real expensive animals. So when I got a call about um, someone wanting to give up a blood python, I was a little concerned. Um, he was having some feeding issues, and, and um, the, the gentleman that I was speaking with was um, uh, assist feeding this animal, and I started getting concerned that maybe he was very sick, so I was getting prepared. We had a, a quarantine. We quarantine everything, but sometimes we, we make it a little more uh, strict quarantine. So I had this all set up to take in this animal, and I started researching my blood pythons to see what, you know, their proper care and everything. And it, the, the one um, main theme of all of my research was that these are very shy snakes and they don't, that they, they like a lot of bedding. They like to be able to hide, to get from point A to point B without being seen. Um, so I kind of imagined that they had set up inappropriately and he wasn't feeling comfortable and maybe wasn't sick after all. So when we got the, the little snake in, we set him up in a, a sweater box with very thick bedding in the bottom. Um, two days after we got him, he ate frozen thawed rat. He's been eating like gangbusters ever since. We have never had to assist him at all. He's eaten on his own um, every week since we've gotten him, and, and he's grown 
and he's actually been the star of stage. He played a water moccasin in a in a stage production. Uh, so it um, um, he's done very well. So it you know you take the time to research the animal that you're looking to get so that you make sure you have them set up to where they're comfortable because if they're not comfortable they're not going to do well. No, no, not at all. Each each species has their own little quirks, and I I even go as far to say each animal its own has its own personality and its few little traits. We have a uh, a little Dumeril, Dumeril's ground boa, and she is extremely shy and will only eat after I feed her and once I go to bed. And she only eats in the pitch black. It's funny. I'll I'll come in a couple of times before night and I'll see her slowly moving, but I'll come out next morning and I usually leave her too, and one will be gone. It's um, it's pretty funny, but yeah, all animals have their little traits and. If you take the time to figure them out, once you do, it's it's so easy to care for them. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Snakes are one of the most uh, ease of care animals that you can, low maintenance, very low maintenance. And, there's, and they have such cool personalities. People, that's the one thing people always look so shocked when I mention the snakes have a, a certain personality oh yeah all of how them can do. you tell oh believe me you can absolutely oh yeah all of when, our snakes are a little bit different they all have different attitudes there's i i almost go as far to say there's no snake with the exact exactly the same personality they all have something that um gets them mix upset but you know they're all they all love love and as soon as you find out how to care for them properly you'll know that they love you. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. We have probably three dozen common boas, or what people refer wow. to as red cell boas, um, varying sizes and varying attitudes. And, um, it, you know, they're all basically the same snake, but they every single one of them is different. And if um, I, can, I can tell who's who, just by watching them for a couple of minutes and watching how they react to me or how they react to a situation, I can tell you who's who. Uh, Zsa Zsa Gaboa, she loves attention. and She wants to be, especially if uh, you have long hair, whether you're a boy or a girl, if you have long hair, she wants to be in your hair. And she, I think she thinks it's like hiding in a tree. I don't know. But she loves being on your shoulder and loves being in your hair and will, will kind of weave in and out of your hair. And Rocky Balboa, he's a little more standoffish, <laughs> but once he gets to know you, he'll warm up to you a little bit. And he likes sitting on your shoulder and will kind of sit and watch the world go by. As long as you don't make a lot of fast hand movements, that makes him a little nervous. But um, he'll sit on your shoulder for a long time as long as you don't move real quick. He takes a little little getting used to you before he'll, uh, he'll warm up to you. Um, we have Albo Achino. Um, he's, he's another one that's a little standoffish, and it takes him a lot longer to come around. So he's not quite as, um, doesn't get to go as many places as some of the other ones do. Um, we have Feather Boa. We have, um, and then we have Fluffy. Uh, Fluffy we, we use for um, what I'm talking with either veterinary students or veterinary technician students, and, and she's my uh, how to deal with a, a nasty snake demo animal because she's not a real happy camper. Um, she's, um, she's had a rough life, and, and she doesn't, doesn't trust people, and, and um, so she, you know, they all have to be dealt with at some time, and, and they're safe ways and, and safe for you and safe for the snake. To be handled, so we use her as our demo for that. That um, these animals can be dealt with in a safe, um, safe manner, and, and we show them how to do that. Yeah, yeah. You always have to learn with the snakes, and sometimes they just don't like to be handled. It doesn't mean that you know they don't like you. It's just sometimes that they just are a little bit more nervous and take a little bit longer to warm up to. In, Absolutely. In fact. Um, we have a couple of snakes that we've taken in that really uh, don't like to be held, but we once we get them out and hook them out, once we let them sit on the hook for a minute, they usually warm up, and after that we can hold them. 
But one, mm-hmm. yeah, but Colombian boas, Colombian red tails, I really love those, especially because they're so nice. And we have one, um, our mascot, Goliath, he's the sweetest little thing on earth. I couldn't imagine whatever hap- what happened to Lucky Stars happened to him because he is, he is my buddy and he... He is the sweetest thing. You couldn't you couldn't hit him and he wouldn't even hiss at you. He is just so sweet. No, I don't hit him, but <laughs> he is just a, <laughs> he is a sweetheart. He um he just loves to sit and hang out with you. He loves to take things from you by wrapping them in his tail. But he especially <laughs> I'll I'll just set him on the back of a chair and he'll just sit there and wait for me to pick him up again. He is the sweetest thing. He has no intention of leaving or going anywhere. He just loves okay. his life. Okay. But, but I, I just wanted to know, so how did you get the story into Reptiles magazine? Well, they had a um oh they had a an a listing for um a contest for life with with reptiles, tell a story. I think it was like 250 words or less, which was quite a challenge because I tend to get a little long-winded, especially with that with her story because you want to make sure you get the the whole the, the whole content of how remarkable she is. So I um, I typed it up and and checked with the the parties involved to make sure that they didn't mind if I used their names or not and uh, sent it off, and then, to be honest, I kind of forgot about it. Uh, and then I got an email saying that my story was one of the finalists and uh, that I that we had a chance of winning, and I got very excited at that point. Well, I bet, I bet you did, yeah. I saw, I, I read the other ones, and while they were good, none of them were quite as moving as Lucky Stars. She's, she's amazing. She just... Um, I still can't believe that um, one that that we that we got her and that that she survived and that she's doing as well. She still amazes me. So I, I um, yeah, I wanted to know um, how does is this the most one of the more um, traumatic stories with your reptiles, or does this happen more frequently? Um, well, the the very first reptile that I ever dealt with, and I'm a former snake phobic, so this is, um, all of all of my snake stories are kind of cool to me, but um, my very first ever reptile that I ever dealt with was an iguana that uh, some folks brought in to the veterinary clinic I was working at. Um, they were clearing a lot, and they saw something move, so they assumed it was a snake, and since we have to kill all snakes, they yeah. had a, a, a weed eater, a weed whacker, oh, and they gosh. started attacking it with the weed whacker. And then they realized that it was an iguana. Ooh. So they, they wrapped it up in a blanket or a towel, and they brought it into the clinic. And they said, we don't want it, but we don't want it to die. Um, so I, I, we took it in, kind of patched her up, and I took her home because nobody else wanted to. And I said, well, I'll take her. I'll see what I can do with her. And we treated her for about six weeks before she passed away. Oh, that's too and bad. And about a week after that, somebody else came in and said, I hear you take lizards. <laughs> like, okay, I guess. <laughs> and it kind of started there. I did have a, I took in a, a, a Burmese python one time that the police department brought me. Uh, was in somebody's neighborhood and a guy, it scared somebody, so he took a shovel Oh, and gosh. beat this snake pretty pretty good. He had seven fractures that we could see when we X-rayed his head. Had seven Ooh. fractures in his in his skull. Ouch! Um, I named him Andrew Borden, who was Lizzie Borden's dad. Um, and I think Andrew lasted about nine months. Well, that's a good time. Yeah, for getting cracked on the head with the shovel, I say that's a very long time for a snake to last. Yeah. Um, and uh, but he he had um, just too much damage to his sinus cavities and and we couldn't as long as he was on antibiotics he would do okay but you can't they can't be on antibiotics forever but then he started having other issues and he just he just didn't he just never did really well but they try so hard and you you just can't give up on them. No, you can't. It's, these are just one of those animals that you've got to try and help them as much as you can. 
So, um, with uh, Lucky Stars, how, um, when you received the call, was this something that you have dealt with before? Have you dealt with similar situations, or was this something that you, once you assessed the damage, it was something completely new for you? Um, as far as getting a call that there's an animal in need? Uh, more as, well, I can see as, since you work with this animal hospice, that probably happens a lot, but more of the damage was, is that something? Oh, I've never, I've never seen anything like that before. Wow. Uh, I'm not on an animal that's still alive. Now we, we also do, um, what we call nuisance reptile calls for the, the local law enforcement. People call, there's a snake in my house, you know, or, or there's one in my garage, come get it. Um, and we've had where we didn't get there fast enough and, you know, people bludgeon them with rocks or, and it's oh. usually a Texas rat snake, yep. uh, an occasional, um, yellow belly water snake. And they just know it's a water moccasin. And, and here we have a lot of Eastern hognose snakes and, of course, they're cobras, you know, so we have to kill those. Oh, yeah. Um, those but, are way too um, dangerous. Oh, yes. And uh, so occasionally, but I guess about 50-50, by the, we get there in time to, to get the little creatures out of there, and, and we have release points where we can uh, rehome them or at least get them out of harm's way and, and uh, uh, get them out of uh, that situation, but uh, every now and then, the either we don't get there fast enough, or uh, somebody's overly zealous and with the with the shovel or the the brick, and, uh, and that's kind of sad. And we'll we'll take the little bodies off, and we got our little memorial garden in the back, and we at least give them a decent burial. And they they may be wildlife, and it's quote just a snake, but we try to at least have a little respect for them. Yeah, I, I, I actually really respect that. Yeah, I've always I've always said, you know, if you're if a snake dies, you know, don't just throw it away, you know, at least have some respect for this animal. This animal couldn't they barely have any defenses and they're almost without venom, no match for humans. So at least give them a proper burial because they Absolutely. often don't know when they come into like somebody's house and it's and so it's not really their fault. They just saw this big thing in their territory, and they thought it'd be a good place to hide. Absolutely. So they were here first. Yeah, yeah, they were. <laughs> so um, I heard that you had a fire in one of your buildings. What was, what happened? We had a propane leak, and um, in our um, iguana shed. Ooh. Our iguana building, where we house our iguanas, um, well, where we house the the majority of our lizards during the winter time, or the cooler months, and uh, we heat them with propane. And we had a propane leak that we didn't know about. And uh, my husband was home, fortunately, and um, heard an explosion. Went outside. There were iguanas everywhere. He started oh. gathering them up um, and putting them in whatever caging he could find they were in dog crates they were in aquariums he just kind of stuffed them everywhere gathered them up um and started moving um i had some a couple of nile monitors and and some tegus and a couple of savannah monitors in caging and he got them out and i got home from work it sent me a text message and i got home from work and we we got the um we have one very large Nile monitor. He's um, just under six feet long and not a real nice guy. And we got him evacuated, got everybody out. We're kind of assessing the damage of the building and um, didn't, he had, uh, he had shut off the propane. There did not seem to be any more fire. He had put out what little bit of, of flames had been out there. Um, and we went into one of the other buildings where we had moved the, the, the animals and were assessing the injuries, and he looked out a window, and it looked like clouds floating by, so he walked outside, and there was incredible smoke. But we had had a pretty steady uh, 20, 25-mile-an-hour north wind all afternoon, and it had apparently there were embers in the wall or something. Anyway, the building flamed on. And we have kind of a little compound. We have our house, and then we have the, the lizard building, and next 
to it or attached to it was my husband's tool shed where he kept all his power his power tools and everything um and then next to it is what we call the serpentarium where we keep our our large um python and then next to it is our um, freezer building where we keep all our freezers and then next to it is um three bedroom mobile home where we keep the bulk of the the snakes and and the uh, turtles that are inside for the winter wow well, that is they're a all it's it's all its little compound and the lizard sheds about 15 feet from my house <laughs> and um i'm hosing is the flames as best i can waiting for the fire department and frank's hosing the house trying to keep our house from catching and it was um a very scary moment yeah i bet um, it was i mean both you know, you had both you know either your house could catch on fire or you know your animals could catch on fire the rest of my animals and um one of our friends a good friend of ours is uh, one of the volunteer firefighters and she had told everybody that we had reptiles and one of the fire firemen uh, I'm sitting there with my little hose and, and they've got their, their big uh, water hoses and he says where's the bad stuff I said excuse me he says you know the bad stuff I said it's in that building right there and if you don't want to have to help me evacuate it you better not let this spread and he kind of reestablished his stance and got after it just a little bit harder and they worked very hard to get the fire out and not let it um, spread anymore. But Frank lost all of his tools, all of our building supplies, and um, he had everything. He's, we, we teased my husband that he's a little OCD because he keeps everything very organized and very separated and, and everything's in its place. And um, he had them all in, in plastic buckets, labels, you know, this is, for electrical work, putting in new plugs. This is for fencing. This and all of that, all mel- it either burned or melted. Mm. And the stuff that didn't necessarily burn is is useless because the the plastic buckets all melted on it. Mm. But he's got he's got some new yard art. Um, he's got a very nice um, sculpture out of the three power saws that he had. They've all kind of melted together. Uh, it's an interesting sculpture, um, but it's. Um, and poor guy, he was. We had to shut off the electricity, so our our fortice buildings out back mm. um, didn't have any heat, and uh, their all their heat lights are out. And he says, "Well, I can just reroute." Oh no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can. Uh, no, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> but we've been we've been very blessed with our our community. Um, our our Aggie family is is pretty tight, and um, right away we had had folks. Um, either loaning us tools or out and out giving us tools. Um, I, you know, I've got two of these. You can have one. Or you know, my dad's not using this anymore. And we've been very blessed, and we've been able to slowly kind of get back on our feet. And, and we're still um, this weekend. We've got another weekend where we're um, getting rid of the wreckage and, and tearing down. Um, buildings and and going to get some new structures up and and things are going to be better definitely going to be better so did you lose any animals in that fire um yes i did um my iguana population went from um 35 to 5. oh that is i am so sorry that is one of those things, you know, with reptiles especially, once you get attached to these animals, it is extremely hard to lose one. It is, and I, I it's real. I have a, a pretty good size outdoor enclosure for them, and this time last year, I could go out there and and just walk through and and talk to them and feed them their little treats. We use fruit as treats, and they'd come up and get their strawberry or their grapes, and and. Uh, some of them are a little tentative. Others, you know, are all over you. They're climbing up your leg, wanting another strawberry, and um, it's kind of kind of barren out there this year. But um, that too, that too will be better. And, and there's always going to be another iguana needing a home. So we've got lots of room for them now, and, and they're going to have a nice new building um, here in the next few weeks. And, and um, 
it's just it's all going to be better. I just the little creatures that are gone, at least while they were here, they had a good life. Oh yeah, and they're in a better place now. They're a better place. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. We've we've been through kind of a rough season too lately. We've gone. We've lost a couple of our old our older snakes that were originally with us and. It's definitely hard once you get attached to an animal and you just start talking to it, and it's just, it's like losing a person. It's like losing a Absolutely. brother. It's just really hard. Absolutely. There is, um, some of my friends on Facebook were making a comment about, um, it was a, a, you know, animal, when you have animals, and mostly, these are mostly mammal people, you know, you know, do, do your friends think you're weird because you talk to your dog and you expect it, you know, you look at it like you're expecting it to answer back? And I'm going, yeah, how do you think I feel? I talk to my my pets and they don't even have ears. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm expecting them to answer back. But they do look at you like they understand. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, yeah, they just kind of give you that look, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, certain, it's certainly um, different. But um, I have a, it's kind of an unrelated question, but, like, I we have a, a male iguana. He's about um, three or four feet tall, th- three or four feet long. Um, and he's very uh, aggressive. He doesn't like to be touched right behind the head. He really doesn't like to be touched at all. He's very um, feisty. He puffs up and gets all defensive whenever I come near. I can I can't even attempt to hold him because he he'll try and bite me. He's actually bitten me and my dad several times. What would I do in a situation like this? What would I do to? It make sounds him... like you have a very healthy iguana. <laughs> well, I, I've heard that there. What people males see, what people mean. don't understand. Do you know why iguanas exist? You know, all animals have a have a reason that they exist. There's a, there's a purpose for them in nature. Do yes. you know why iguanas exist? I'm not sure. They are a prey animal. They are food for everything else in the South American jungle. So if you think about it, if you spend your entire life waiting for something to eat you, what kind of personality is that going to give you? Yeah, probably not a nice one. <laughs> not a nice one. And iguanas are like the number one sold reptile in the world. And the reason they're in that position is because they're incredibly inexpensive. Just to maintain the status quo, the females have to lay an incredible number of eggs because only about a quarter of her clutch actually makes it to adulthood. So they have to lay very large eggs, large clutches of eggs. And when you artificially incubate that, you get a pretty high percentage that will hatch, like 95 to 99 percent will actually hatch. Wow. So they can sell them very inexpensively. And they're adorable when they're little. Oh, they are. Things are. But they're so cute. So people buy them. They're cheap and they're cute. They don't put a whole lot of thought into the care that goes into them. And these are not the easiest animals to take care of. And what I tell people is if you have a nice iguana, there's something wrong with it. Because these animals cannot afford to be nice. Okay, it's so not in, it's not in their in their makeup. It's not in their personality. If they're nice, they get eaten by something. But they're eaten by birds. They're eaten by other lizards. They're eaten by snakes. They're eaten by people. They're called they call them chicken of the trees. They're eaten by big cats. They're eaten by everything. Wow. So they can't afford to be nice. So if you've got one that's that aggressive, one, you have a male. Females can, can be a little bit nicer, but not a whole lot. The male, and you being a male and it being a male, it's going to uh, challenge you. Okay, okay so, so, yeah, it's so not. It, just, it sounds like you have a very healthy iguana. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> so basically these animals don't get uh, really nicer over time. They just kind of stay that way, especially the males. Right. You okay. may have one that tolerates you. No, mine you doesn't. May have no. one, you may have one that will, because some people will swear up and down that they have a nice iguana, and basically what they have is an iguana that has trained them <laughs> to read them and will tolerate the humans up to a point. And... For people who are not expecting a whole lot more from their iguana, they're fine. And as far as they're concerned, that's a, a nice iguana. 
but as far as what the general population is expecting, when you say a nice pet, they're expecting you're never going to have that in a healthy iguana. Well, yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely true. Well, in that case, I guess I have a really healthy iguana because ours disdains <laughs> us. He absolutely. Well, like doing I come in the job. room. I come in the room, and he's like, "Darn it! I thought you died in your sleep." He does not <laughs> like me. I swear, and I, I bet pick. He's really thinking that too. Oh gosh, I pick him up, and he's just like, mm, "I can't wait to get a hold on of that finger and just." <laughs> he does not like me. But we took in. I, I we took in a ma- Say what? Go ahead. Oh, um, we took in a male iguana from a gentleman. Um, who thought it would be cool to have one loose in his apartment. Oh, gosh. <laughs> uh, he had a, a pretty decent setup, had him on a good diet, but he let him run loose in his apartment. And once that lizard reached maturity, um, he took the male as a challenge and jumped him. The guy went in to take a shower, and he had the basking area set up for his lizard in the bathroom. And he, male iguanas, Mature male iguanas are very territorial. And this guy went in to take a shower, and this lizard jumped him, bit him in the face, and took the end of his nose off. Dang. And he called me uh, crying, and crying men just, I just, they get to me. Um, and he said, I, I don't mind telling you, I'm afraid of my lizard, and I'm boarding him at the vet. And if, if you can't take him, nobody else will. And a lot of times, um, Rescues will take females or they'll take young males, but they won't take mature males and they won't take uh, iguanas that have are aggressive towards people. And I don't care. I'll I'll take them all. Oh yeah. And uh, so we we took him and this poor guy. He was a nice looking young man, except he's missing half his nose and he was looking at five to seven years of plastic surgery to put his face back together. Ow! If he would just had a cage. If he just had a cage, yeah. he would have been fine. Yeah. And Buddy, Buddy did really well. He, uh, we didn't let him run loose. He, you know, was confined uh, in a. It was an apartment size, but he had a good size cage, and he did well. And um, we had him for close to eleven years. Wow. Well, I now that I've heard that, I think our iguana isn't really a strong disdain. It's more like a strong disgust because I put him <laughs> around. I put him around my room. He doesn't really jump me. Actually, as a matter of fact, when I let him around in my room, I'll just kind of sit and read a book or play a video game. He'll he'll crawl over you and he'll come sit in your lap. But as long as it's his idea, the second you move your foot or something, you better you better get him off your lap because he'll try and bite you. <laughs> yep. It's got to be their idea. So, um, to uh, wrap this up, where can Scaly fan, where can Scaly Adventure fans and all kinds of people who just love animals, where can they connect with you to learn more about this? Um, well, we have a Facebook page. It's Reptile Hospice and Sanctuary of Texas, and I think if you search Reptile Hospice. We should pop up. Um, our um, profile picture is a picture of my daughter in her Aggie 12th man jersey with um, a big boa constrictor wrapped around her. And um, that's us. And there's some new pictures of lucky stars on there. You can go to Reptile Hospice and Sanctuary Texas.com or I think it's abbreviated to R Hands, R H A N D S T.com. Okay, yeah, Our that's Okay, well that's great. Well, um thank you so much for your time. This has been great having you here. Well, it's been my pleasure and it just tickles me that somebody so far away would be interested in my little snake. Oh yeah, I mean, I saw that story. I'm just like, "Oh my gosh, anybody who can make a boa recover from something like that, I've got to talk to this person." Well, it's been it's been a real pleasure getting to know you, and I hope you'll stay in touch with us. Oh, definitely. Well, we'll. Um, and if you're ever down, if you're ever down in this area, I hope you come by. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we'll have to uh, come by and see your awesome sanctuary. We'd love to have you. And my husband grills a mean burger. <laughs> well, I'll make sure to come down start. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we'll keep in touch. 
thank awesome. you. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been my pleasure. All right. We'll uh, talk to you later then. All righty.